Hi everyone, um, thank you for attending this webinar. So my name is Stephanie Bush. I work at the Vermont Department of Health. I'm the EMS for Children's Program Coordinator. Um, and really what that means is that I work with everyone that works with kids to make sure that EMS providers and services have the right training, um, equipment, policies, and procedures to treat kids. And when I'm talking about kids, in general, I'm talking about under the age of 18, um, but everyone kind of has their own definition for kids. <laughs> um, so today, for the objectives, I'm going to talk about how the Vermont emergency medical system functions, um, what happens during a 911 initiated emergency call, how are EMS agencies and providers prepared to treat kids, um, and especially medically complex kids, and then some of the benefits and how to connect with your local EMS agencies and providers to, in the event of an emergency, hopefully have a better outcome and experience for all parties involved. Um, so just a little bit to talk about EMS for Children. As I said, um, I'm a program manager for the state of Vermont. EMS for Children is a program that's been around since 1985, and really it's working to make sure that, that kids and adolescents, no matter where they, they live, play, attend school, and travel, um, are going to receive the appropriate and um, effective emergency care. And that's including pre-hospital, kind of ambulance setting, but then also in the emergency department. I'm funded through HRSA. Um, and my program, it's a state partnership program, is really guided by 10 performance measures, um, again, in the pre-hospital emergency setting. So I'm curious, uh, when, you, when someone thinks of EMS, what are words that come to mind? Um, you can either type it in your, the question area, or you can just kind of think about it to yourself. So for a lot of people, uh, when we talk about EMS, a lot of um, lay people or common, um, the kind of common audience, they hear EMS, and some words that come to mind are first responders or medics, EMTs, paramedics. Uh, we use the term squad or crew. So all these words or all these terms are used to kind of describe EMS but also um, other things. So in the state of Vermont, we have four levels of providers. So here's some definitions that I'm going to describe and try and create some common language. So when we're talking about EMS and EMTs and advanced EMTs um, or really important BLS, which is basic life support and advanced life support, there's a little bit better understanding of kind of what those words mean and if they're specific or generic. So I use the term EMS often, um, and really that just stands for is emergency medical services. Most people, when they're talking about EMS, they're generally talking about the pre-hospital setting. So that's, um, we'll get into first response and ambulances. So that's out of the hospital, um, on scene, in a nursing home, kind of whatever, wherever the scene is, that's pre-hospital EMS. EMS also encompasses the emergency department. It's just kind of a definitive care um, extension of EMS. Um, in the state of Vermont, um, EMS providers are medically trained providers that are trained in pre-hospital emergency care. There's four levels. Um, and that's different in different states. Um, this four-level version or system is um, increasing on the national scale. But sometimes you'll also hear people talk about EMTIs, which are intermediates. You'll hear um, there used to be EMTDs, which were EMT defibrillators. So when um, AEDs came out in the beginning, you had to get this special training of how to do use an AED. And then you got a D on your patch. Um, but so currently in Vermont, we have four levels. There's the emergency medical responder, the emergency medical technician, and those two levels are considered BLS or basic life support, and then advanced life support are the advanced EMT and the paramedic. 
and we'll talk more about kind of the scope of practice among these providers. Um, so I just mentioned it, um, BLS and ALS. So EMR, EMT is considered a BLS provider, advanced EMT and paramedic is considered an ALS or advanced life support provider. And that, um, those are important to consider. We'll talk about this a little bit more, but in the event of an emergency for a family member or yourself, depending on the situation, an advanced life support provider might be um, able to provide medications or um, provide a higher level of care for whatever the situation is. So in the state of Vermont, um, we have three different levels of uh, ambulances. So again, there's the BLS or EMT crew where they have um, training for kind of so basic skills, including patient assessment, uh, assisting, doing CPR and assisting with CPR, giving oxygen for a conscious hypoglycemic patient that is able to swallow. They can help with um, administer oral glucose. They can assist patients with certain kinds of medications. So for example, if you have um, a patient that has an anaphylactic shot, um, reaction, they can assist the patient, it's a very important part of it, assist the patient um, with their auto injector, like an EpiPen of some sort. Um, they can also, so they can also help with uh, ALS crews doing various things. So the next level, which is going to be the most common level, is going to be the advanced EMT. So they have additional training and they have a wider scope of practice. So they can start IVs, they can administer some types of medication um, beyond what a, an EMT can. And then, um, yeah, so they're a little more advanced. They can give some, uh, some additional medications. So then a paramedic has the most training of EMS providers. And then, so they have the largest scope of practice and they can give additional medications such as medications that can stop seizures. Um, they also can do advanced airways, so if there is a patient that needs to be intubated um, with the advanced equipment, a paramedic can do that. An EMT or an advanced EMT can help with some intubation stuff, um, but it's a much more narrow scope. And um, But all these providers are um, adhere to Vermont's statewide protocols, which are kind of like our standing orders. And it's one thing that's, that's pretty unique about Vermont is that in Vermont, no matter where you are, the same level provider is going to be providing the same level of care. Um, so in places such as Texas, you might have, if you need to be intubated, if you're in one town, you might get intubated by an EMT or by a, a paramedic or maybe an, um, a supervising paramedic, so someone with a higher level of care and more experience. Or you could be in a different town where an advanced EMT is allowed to intubate. Oh, um, then for clarification, an intubation is when there is an, an issue with someone's airway, they are ha having difficulty breathing and actually need to have some kind of medical equipment that's actually inserted and in, put into their mouth and down to their lungs so they are able to breathe. So um, if they don't have, if they aren't able to breathe on their own for some reason, we, can, we have medical equipment that can protect their airway and provide um, oxygen to them. Something you don't want to screw up. <laughs> um, yeah. So this, so levels of care, and, and I realize this is a lot of information that I'm throwing at people. The part of this is I think it's important for, for people to understand, especially families that have kids with special health care needs, is that if I have a child that has a seizure disorder, it's really important to articulate that. So in the event of 
let's say your child's having a seizure and it's not stopping or they're not returning um, back to normal before they go into another seizure, it's important that when you're talking with 911 to let them know that your child has a known seizure disorder and that they've been seizing for however many minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes. So wh what can happen is that dispatch, the people that you're talking with can let the EMS crew know that it's a known seizure disorder and that the, the, the parent understands that there is an issue, that it's a known issue, and that they're counting how long, or they're keeping track of how long they've been seizing. And that way that the crew, if possible, they can get maybe a paramedic on board sooner and activate those additional resources so a paramedic can come and help give medication to stop those seizures. Um, on the flip side, I've been on calls where there was an adult that quote unquote was seizing and what was actually happening is that they were just having a fit because their partner was throwing them out of their house. So they were faking a seizure um, and what happened was that there was a, an EMT crew that went out, realized that they were fine and they were just really mad and um, that puts a, a, a burden on the whole system that if they were to get a paramedic to come out and then realize that the call was basically a fake call. I mean, it was definitely required some emergency services, but not a medical team to uh, resolve the, the domestic situation. So it's good to, to articulate if there's known disorders or if there's um, information that you can give nine, the 911 dispatch people, and then we can kind of activate resources on our end sooner and hopefully um, resolve some of those issues. So in Vermont, it's a, probably a little bit of a granulated picture. All of these uh, Star of Life are where all of our EMS agencies are. Um, so we kind of, our, our EMS agencies are right into two kind of groups. There's our fast squads or first response services and what those agencies are, are EMS agencies with licensed providers that will drive to a scene in their own personal vehicle and provide care, but not transport. Um, I think a really good example of um, in the Chittenden County area is the Jericho Underhill area. So during the day, they do have an ambulance service. They have an ambulance that's out in that area, but at night there's people that are responding to a call from their own home to provide some care until an ambulance crew arrives. Um, so then the ambulance services are the EMS agencies that have one or multiple ambulances that drive to the scene um, with their ambulance that have additional equipment because they have a bigger vehicle um, and have a crew of between two and probably five people depending on the situation um, and they're able to actually transport so if they need if a patient needs to go to the emergency department um, they can actually take that patient to the emergency department so there's kind of two different areas or two different types of services um, and what the first response services really do is allow a quicker response and, and that um, from the time that you call 911 till the time that a medical provider shows up on scene and they, um, they have equipment, they are equally trained, they don't necessarily have as much equipment, but they can start that care um, quicker and then when the ambulance shows up, they can um, help out. Um, there is a link, and I think we could probably um, send like a separate link to so people service people can find out which service they um, run with. Excuse me, I'm, I think I'm getting allergies. The other thing too to think about, um, you probably can't see very hard, so 
I personally run with Colchester Rescue in Colchester. Um, I actually ran last night. Luckily, we didn't have any calls past 11. Um, and, and one of the things I haven't, I didn't put in this uh, presentation is talking about mutual aid. So in Colchester, we respond to a majority of the Colchester area up to the Milton line and the Burlington line. And then um, St. Mike's covers some of around St. Mike's College. When we are out on a call, our mutual aid services will respond to a call within our, our area. So if, for example, we have to go to the price chopper in Colchester to respond to someone that slipped and fell in the um, vegetable area, and then we have another call in Mallets Bay, which is also our area, then Essex or St. Mike's Rescue will come into our service area and provide care um, because we're on a different call. Um, for example, Burlington has multiple ambulances and they kind of cover their area, but still sometimes other there is mutual aid. So just so you know that just because you live in a certain area doesn't always mean that just that service is going to respond to a call. Um, so in Vermont, we are pretty fortunate in that our pediatric calls only represent about 6% of our responses. In some areas, it's more like 10%. Um, and these are just some statistics for our calls. So last year, in 2015, we had almost 70,000 patients that were treated and transported. Um, and we transport about 75% of the patients that we come in contact with. Um, and then last, or in 2015, a little um, 4,500 kids were treated and transported. So you can kind of see um, our highest percentage of pediatric calls are in the Chittenden County area, um, which makes sense because that's where most of the kids are. So next question is, um, I want to talk a little bit about what happens during the 911 call. Um, and yeah, that. So curious if you, um, and I, I think towards the end when we're kind of doing answer or question answer, I'd really love to hear about people's experiences with 911. And I mean, the whole point of this, this webinar is to hopefully increase, improve people's experiences in the future. Um, so during a 911 initiated call, um, there is a point where either a parent or a family member where 911 is determined that it needs to be um, utilized. So Vermont's kind of cool in that you can either call or text. Um, there are some challenges I know with texting in that it's a little bit harder to, to determine your location. So if you can call, it's great. It goes to one of our PSAP centers. Um, don't ask me what PSAP stands for. It's some kind of a switchboard. Um, and there's several of them throughout the state of Vermont. Um, so for example, if you're in Colchester, you call 911, it's probably going to um, go to, I think, the Williston PSAP Center and you tell them what's happening and where you are, and then it's determined that Colchester is the closest responding agency, then our local dispatch, which happens to be at the Colchester Police Station, would then dispatch us and whatever resources that were needed, so whether it's um, police or fire, to respond to whatever that scene is. Uh, we respond and then we make um, contact with the patient. Uh, another example would be like if you were in Milton, um, had a situation that's going on, their local dispatch is also Colchester Police. They would dispatch Milton um, Rescue or potentially us because we're second into Milton. Um, so if you had a, a, a call or a situation. A lot, I think a lot of people don't necessarily know that there's a difference between the, the 
person that you're initially talking to on the 911 person and dispatch. So what can happen sometimes is information doesn't always get relayed. Um, so it's, it, it can be super important to try and provide as much information as you can so then that information can get relayed to dispatch and then to us. Uh, so EMS arrives. Depending on what information is relayed initially and then also what EMS crew is available during that time, it, you could end up with a, a basic life support crew or advanced life support crew. Um, so for example, I know that AMCARE, which covers the St. Albans area, they almost always have an ALS crew, so either an, an advanced EMT or a paramedic that's on their, with their service. Um, there are other areas where they really only function as a basic life support crew, which isn't a bad thing. It just, um, it's dependent on what their agencies, what they're licensed at, and then what kind of providers they have. Um, Burlington, I believe they always have a paramedic within their service area. So if there's a call that sounds like it maybe needs a paramedic, they can go with them. Um, as I mentioned before, like if you're in Jericho, Underhill area, and it's nighttime, you're most likely the first people that are going to arrive on scene are the first response. People that are um, coming in their own personal vehicles from home or work um, to start that um, EMS care. Also, depending on the situation, um, fire and police might show up as well. Some of the other things too that I'm not sure people's experience is that there's kind of two different things. So there's some people that will stay on scene a little bit longer, especially like if they're, um, for example, a hypoglycemic patient that it's actually found that it's better to stay on scene and try and get their blood sugar to go up a little bit. If they're conscious and able to swallow, then you can stay on scene with them, give them oral glucose, get them drinking orange juice with sugar in it, which sounds really gross, but it's really important. <laughs> um, or is it like a, a really life-threatening situation? Um, you cut your foot off and EMS can control the bleeding, but you need to get to the hospital. You need to get there pretty quickly. They're going to transport uh, more quickly. Or um, sometimes if we have patients that are difficulty breathing, we can try and stay on scene for a little bit, get them some oxygen, try and get their, um, their O2 levels to go up, and then make the decision of do we need to transport or not. And that's one of the things I'm not sure everyone knows. Just because you call 911, I think hypoglycemic uh, patients are a really good example. Someone is a diabetic, they take their insulin, and then instead of eating, maybe they take a nap, or they don't feel well, and so they don't eat as much, and so they're, they become hypoglycemic. 911's called, we stay on, I remember a call where we stayed on scene for 45 minutes, got the patient's blood sugar up, they were with family that could monitor them throughout the night. They didn't need to be transported. They just had a, made a mistake, took their insulin, didn't eat, crashed, couldn't get back up. Um, they didn't need to be transported. They were kind of, their partner was watching them for the rest of the night. It was fine. Versus a diabetic patient that took insulin and is maybe sick. Their body's not processing the blood sugar like it's supposed to. And maybe they need to come into the emergency department to be looked at, to have some additional tests. That's a situation um, where transport is important. And that, that conversation typically happens with the EMS crew or the crew captain, the person in charge, and then the, the family members and the patient. You know, If they're one, then they're not necessarily going to be involved in that conversation. Um, but so it's a, it's a conversation and a decision made with everyone. Sometimes we can get doctors on, um, on the phone to have conversations and figure out what we need to do um, to help make that the best decision for the patient. Um, so 
I think a, a good question is how are EMS providers uh, prepared to treat kids, um, specifically medically complex kids? Um, there's a wide variety of training depending on what level of provider um, the EMS provider is. There's a number of, so paramedics typically go to about a full year of training um, before, and then they test and whatnot to become paramedics. Uh, an EMT and EMR, it's about uh, one semester of training. So there's initial training where we learn about treating pediatrics and then kind of the general term of special health care needs. And then also to maintain our licenses, like a lot of nurses and doctors have to do, we have continuing education requirements. Um, in the state of Vermont, some of our continuing education requirements does include special health care needs and pediatrics. Um, and what else would be? Um, behavioral emergencies, endocrine emergencies, um, professionalism is also another category, uh, vulnerable populations another category. So we do a lot of training around all of those things. Um, we also have, like, as I said previously, our statewide protocols which really outline if there's, for example, a hypoglycemic patient, there's our standing orders right there. All ambulances and a bunch of providers have that printed um, protocols right there if they need to reference them. We also have a wide variety of equipment that specialize for pediatrics. I'm not sure if you can see on the lower right hand corner um, by the kid's foot, there's kind of like a green and orange and a blue strip. And what that is is actually a length um, weight based measuring system. So for a quote unquote average kid, that is so many inches long, they're going to be approximately so many kilograms, in which case when people are giving medication, that's a factor they need to consider. Beyond my scope, because I can't really give any medications, but advanced EMTs and paramedics um, can use the, that equipment uh, to determine what, how much medication to give. Um, and a big piece too is, is just experience. Uh, the more that people interact with kids and specifically medically complex kids, the more comfortable they're going to be. Um, it's one thing to talk about how to t check the vital signs of a two-year-old and the kind of the theory behind it. And then it's another thing to accidentally say, can I take your blood pressure? And kids have no idea what that means. And so they can freak out. And then they also, the other thing too is you can say no. And you're like, well, it's actually not an option. I need to check it. Um, so learning how to talk with kids and, um, and getting familiar with some of the more specialized equipment, um, like kids on, on ventilators or with a GI tube or um, kids on, on the autism spectrum and, and understanding that to not agitate kids, you can turn off the lights or reduce the amount of stimuli that kids are experiencing in the back of the rig. Um, that's a big piece of it. Um, so Dartmouth is really great and they actually include EMS as a part of their care plan. So when kids leave the hospital and um, discuss the kind of, and discuss with their parents the discharge plan, contacting their local EMS is a part of that which is what we're going to talk about. So opportunities, more training. Um, there's a number of squads that do monthly trainings. Um, for example, my experience running as an EMS provider is with Colchester. And several years ago, before my time, they had a patient that had an LVAD, which is a, a heart thing. Um, and the, the patient that lived in that community and their care team actually came to Colchester Rescue and they did a training on that kind of equipment. So one of the really interesting things about LVADs is that those patients don't have pulses. It could really freak you out if you're trying, if you're responding to an emergency and your patient doesn't have a pulse. 
Um, so that's kind of like the good pre-planning. We got to know this patient. Um, so in the event of an emergency, we aren't going to start trying to do CPR on somebody that's never going to have a pulse. Um, but yeah, so having EMS as a part of the care plan, I think it's a really good, a really good potential um, opportunity. So the other um, put, thing I put was kind of home visits or station visits. Um, EMS week is coming up. It's during May 20, the week of May 22nd. I can't quite remember what week that is. Um, a number of EMS agencies are doing open houses. So it's an opportunity or like people will do like touch a truck event. It's an opportunity for, for families and children to go and see the equipment, to go jump up on a stretcher when they're not having an emergency, um, to see what it's like to put a, a, a mask on their face so that they could have oxygen. It can be really frightening for a kid that's having a, like, or, and an adult, lots of adults freak out too, where they're having a problem breathing and you're saying, I'm gonna put this thing on your face it's going to make you breathe better, but you're already having, like, people can kind of have anxiety, um, and then I'm going to do this other thing that can freak people out. But doing the touch truck events or the station visits is an opportunity for kids to go and play with that kind of equipment. So in the event of an emergency later on in the future, it's not going to be quite as foreign. Um, so the home visits part, there's opportunity, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this um, opportunity for what's kind of called like baseline visits. So if you have a kid, um, we see this with like COPD patients, where their normal oxygen levels are like they're good at in the upper eight, or upper 80s. Uh, normal people, if it's uh, people that, that don't have respiratory issues, if their oxygen levels go under 94%, they start having confusion or anxiety. Something's happening where their body's not getting oxygen. Uh, with a COPD patient, they might be golden at 90%. Um, so that's really under, like, the importance of understanding like where the patient is uh, during baseline. Like, what is their normal day-to-day look like how do they look how do they breathe um, and understanding that the little kids are very different um, especially kids that have medically like they're medically complex you know maybe their normal is something that looks very different than kind of just everyday person um, another big piece and this goes for for children and adults is having emergency and like medical information available um, so it's up in the upper right-hand corner, and I'm going to provide a link. I don't know if you guys already have this on your, your um, form, but it's basically a very concise two pages, what's going on with this, this person. So what kind of medications do they get or do they take? What are their current diagnoses? Are they allergic to latex? Kind of just a wide variety. Who's the contact information? So if your child's at school, um, if the school nurse has this information, if there's a situation that happens, whether it's a medical emergency or maybe the kid just falls down and broke an arm, um, having all that information in a very concise, up-to-date form can be really helpful um, for EMS providers and then also EMS or for the emergency department. Um, also, I'll just real quick say, so in the middle, there's I, I talked about patient assessment. And with pediatrics, we really talk about the pediatric assessment triangle, which the three pieces of it are appearance, uh, work of breathing, and um, circulation to skin. So in general, does this kid look sick? Um, that first impression, you walk into the room and you see a kid and they look really sick, we encourage providers to, to um, kind of go with their gut initially because kids will do really, really well until they crash. Um, so connecting, I talked about a little bit already, so connecting with your local EMS agency. One of the big pieces of it is planning. Um, so if you have a, a, a kid or, or even just a family member 
that has specialized equipment, if they are dependent on equipment, planning for, you know, in the event of emergency, how are we going to transport this kid safely to the emergency department? If they have a big battery pack that goes with them, how are we going to transport that with the child? Um, thinking about in the event of transporting family members, is there a way that, um, especially with kids, we often will welcome parents to come with us to ride in the back of the ambulance. It really helps the anxiety of the family members, anxiety of the child, anxiety of everybody, um, if there's that, that special, that care provider that really knows their kid. Um, so up in the upper left-hand corner, the kid playing with a teddy bear and the stethoscope. As I said, it's um, doing either a baseline visit or coming and connecting with your local service, doing a, um, a touch a truck event. It gives a, the child an opportunity to, to see the, the big scary ambulance and all the equipment that they're going to want to touch the kid with. Um, and hopefully we'll do some anxiety levels. Um, practice. So you can kind of see in the lower left-hand corner, if there's an opportunity, um, we have initial training, we have continuing education training, but if we know that there's a kid in our service area that has a GI tube or has special equipment, then we can do additional training as a service to be better prepared for that special um, kid, that, you know, your loved ones. You know, just like the, with the LVAD patient, we do learn about that. We, we have required training on that, but the fact that we have someone in our service area that has that unique need, we want to make sure that we're prepared to treat that patient. Um, I think another good example of that is kids um, with behavior diagnoses. Um, you know, someone's on the autism spectrum, and we know that there's going to be these kids or family members that don't want to be touched, um, that there's a certain way that we can approach them that won't aggravate them and have, like I said, a better outcome for everybody, then we can be better prepared. Um, and also know the, part, the players that are involved. Parents know so much about their kids, especially kids with, that have met, um, special health care needs, they really are the experts, and sometimes EMS providers, not all of them, uh, need to be reminded that the parents are the experts and that they, they know what their kids look like um, at baseline. And so having those conversations before there's an emergency and everyone's freaking out can be very helpful. Um, the emergency information form, like I said, that's a great um, great piece of equipment that um, should be updated regularly, but it can be really helpful. I, I know I've been on a number of calls when you talk to people and you ask them if they're sick and they say, no, I'm great. And then they would say, well, what kind of medication you are, are you on? And they say, this and this and this and this. And they're like, but you're healthy, right? <laughs> um, so having that information kind of on a form can be super helpful. Um, I also want to point out in the lower right-hand corner, making sure that your house is clearly identifiable. Um, next time you drive by your, your mailbox or your street number or whatever it is that you use to identify your house, can you see it at night? Could you see it in a snowstorm? Um, there's been multiple times, and I've heard of a lot of people, where that time from 911 call to when EMS arrives can be delayed because we can't find the house. Um, so if you're in the Colchester area, our, our service actually offers the free emergency um, house signs, but making sure that your house is visible and we know where it is will help reduce the amount of time until we get there. Uh, so reviewing the objectives, so we talked about the 911 or the EMS system in Vermont. We have four levels of providers. We have people that will show up in their personal vehicles, 
to start care and then also ambulances. It really depends on kind of your area. Um, what happens during a 911 call? Why it's important to provide inform like accurate information to the 911 dispatcher so we can um, start start activating the resources needed. Um, EMS agencies and providers are prepared to treat kids and medically complex kids, but there's always more opportunities to learn um, and the benefit and how to connect with their local EMS agencies. Kind of, again, getting all of that planning done before there's an actual emergency, getting the kids and family members connected with EMS so it's a friendly face that's coming to help you out when you have an emergency, not a stranger that's going to come into your home. And I know we had some questions. Okay, so one of the questions are, um, are there situations where EMS providers arrive concurrently with police or mental health providers? Uh, what is important to know? So there is, um, so depending on what town you are in, there are some places, so for example, Colchester, as long as the police are available, they will come with us every time and Often what it is, um, is just, it's a helping hand there. It's a great opportunity for the police to interact with the community in a generally positive experience. And then also because they know our rig so well, they can help us out. Um, if there's a CPR situation, then they can help out with CPR. There's um, a number of opportunities. So there's... Also, the Team 2, which is a kind of a newer initiative, and that's during a mental health crisis, whether it, um, in the general sense, uh, police and community health providers are connecting together in teams, and, um, and the EMS is starting to get involved in this. So the whole idea is you might helping everybody that are experts in their own area to work as a team to, to come together. Um, and I think it's just important to know that um, it might be a lot of people, which, and I think thinking of, like, if someone doesn't do so well with lots of, like, a, no, a crowd, that might be something to think about. And, um, again, connecting with with people beforehand. So say, okay, well, here's my family member does isn't going to do well with 10 people around them. How can we limit that, um, that stimulus? So one of the questions was, why isn't there always a paramedic on board? That is a great question. Um, so in the state of Vermont, we have just over 300 paramedics. We have over 3,000 provider, EMS providers overall. Um, and a big part of why there isn't always a paramedic is that as a state system, we can't afford it. Um, so our system in Vermont is about 70% volunteer. So it's people that are volunteering their time out of their day to be on an ambulance to respond to 911 calls. Um, some areas are very, for it's, and also, so along with that too, is how it's funded. So there are a number of EMS agencies that are um, not supported by a town at all. So, so Colchester and Burlington um, are, are examples. I, I know Chittenden County the, the most, which is why I'm using this example. Um, their services are funded through their town. Um, however, what's a good example? Um, Amcare, which is out in the St. Albans and Swanton area, they are basically a non, or they're a for-profit service that services a number of towns. So they get paid a certain amount of money to, um, to be available. 
there are areas within the state where the town does not pay them. So the um, and so thinking about if you have a crew, even of two people that are available 24 seven, that can be very expensive if you're only going on reimbursement. So the only way that ambulance services can be paid for transports or for going out to calls is if they transport. So the system is kind of evolving um, and it's challenging. And I would say if you're in an area that doesn't have a paramedic, you could um, find out what, why, um, and also help support a system that would support that high, higher level of care. Um, yeah, so another question is, is there a way of knowing if there's a local fast squad or around your home and they would be sent, if available, to an ambulance um, or if you need to request them? So, so it, it just kind of depends on your area. So when you call 911, the dispatcher is going to send out whatever EMS agency is the closest. So what can happen is the local fast squad and the ambulance get toned out first, like they get toned out together. And then what happens is once those people get on the road, so whether it's a, a provider that's responding from home, they will say, EMT, blah, 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 I am responding to the scene. Ambulance will say, we're on the road, we're heading to that scene as well. So like, it, there's all communication that's saying who's going where. So then what happens is if, for example, like with Colchester, if we're out in somewhere else or on a call, then we can say we're busy, and then they'll tone out um, the local fire service, which is a fast squad in our area. But then they'll also will tone out St. Mike's, which is the second ambulance into that area. So you don't need to request them. That's like kind of all behind the scenes. So how can we find out if our local EMS truck or EMS agency is having a open house or touch truck event? Um, that's a great question. So I would say you could check in with your town and see um, if they have any kind of. There's a lot of flyers that will go around, but so you can, um, if you can find out who your local agency is, you can contact them and ask them or like check out their Facebook or check with the local town if they're having an event. Um, where will I find the link for the emergency information form? Uh, we can link the emergency information form on our website under resources by topic slash emergency services on the Vermont Family Network website. Thank you everyone for all these questions. Um, do you get calls to transport kids who are experiencing behavioral or mental health challenges? Um, can you comment on protocols around restraints, de-escalation techniques? That's a great question. Um, so yes, we do get calls for people that are experiencing behavioral challenges. Um, sometimes it's not necessarily known if someone's having um, a drug-induced issue or I don't want to say something normal, but <laughs> yeah, or a mental health crisis. Um, so we do have protocol, very strict protocols around physical restraints, and that's really done um, so in the event, I can think of a call that we had, it was a, a drug-induced issue, and we ended up having to use physical restraints. And in a situation where we're using physical restraints, um, we would have to contact the emergency department to get permission. And there's very strict protocols around um, when to use them, how you would have to check for pulses in the limbs, and then also requesting a paramedic to do a chemical restraint as well. Um, that's the kind of worst case scenario. We really don't want to restrain people physically if we, if we don't have to or even chemically. And so one of the things that we do um, trainings on is around de-escalation. Um, 
there's 3,000 providers in the state. There's going to be some that are much better than others. <laughs> um, but we're dealing, in general, we work with patients that are experiencing the worst thing. They're having a really bad day. And even if you have a patient who, I mean, I can think of a number of calls that had underlying medical conditions that got really anxious and ended up having other mental health issues because of that. And so we really try and work to create an environment that's calming as it can be, um, working, and that's, again, where kind of the experience comes through, or working with patients and figuring out how can we make the situation better and the best that we can. Um, so the next question is, do parents have the right to ride in the EMS vehicle to the hospital with these kids? Um, so it's, in general, it's dependent on the crew captain. So if we think, if we have a parent, so in general, I would say pa parents are going to be able to ride. It's generally better outcome for everybody. The kids feel better. The parents feel better. They're not driving erratically behind the ambulance. Um, but I will say that if there is a situation where we think that it's going to be worse, then we might encourage the, pa the parent to ride up front, um, so like in the passenger seat, or maybe find someone to ride with them. So I, I can recall a situation, it didn't involve kids, um, and it was an elderly patient, and it was like the, the child, the adult child. Um, and what we ended up happening is the person was having a really bad anxiety, the, the child was having a really bad anxiety attack, was kind of escalating the situation. So we end up having them do is ride the police officer that was with us, took them to the emergency department, but because they, they were at a point where they were disrupting care. And so it really wasn't the best situation for them to be in the back of the ambulance, but we wanted them to go with the, the patient. Um, so can children under the age of 18 refuse treatment, uh, for example, a teenager? Um, so with, I think the age is 16, I'm, it's in our protocols, I can't quite remember. So a teenager, so um, I can think of a call where we had a motor vehicle crash. It was a, a minor fender bender. Two children were together driving legally and all that stuff. So what we ended up having to do is, so they can't really refuse care. So what the kind of plan is to contact a patient, um, the patient's parents. Typically what will happen is they've are, patients have already been called, their um, parents have already been called, they're already on their way. What we've done in the past is either hang out with the patient. Um, so maybe the, the, you know, they have a couple cuts and bruises on their face. They don't need to be transported via ambulance, but they, you know, the, but their parents are going to come pick them up and then take them to the emergency department. One will either will wait with them, we'll have the police wait with them, or um, what we what allows what our protocol allows us to do is to contact them via phone and get permission to um, basically refuse care. Uh, having said that. If we had a patient, a, a teenager, that had a, a serious injury or illness, we would probably either um, encourage them very strongly. <laughs> um, we also have the option of having police take them into custody. It doesn't happen very often where we thought that there was a life-threatening situation going on and they really need to go to the emergency department. We were not able to get connected with the patient's parents we could have we could have them taken under custody and then transport them. That doesn't happen very often because normally when a teenager is injured or ill, the parents are going to say, yes, please take my child or I'm coming right now. Um, we are also, I would say that too, we are also mandatory reporters. So if there are situations that are strange or raise red flags. Um, I would say in general, most providers 
will advocate for the patient um, and whether that is no, we need to transport them and getting other people involved or making a report later on um, to make sure that the patient is well cared for. And that's elderly and also kids. Um, if anyone has any more questions? Um, excuse me. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Please visit the Vermont Family Network's website at vermontfamilynetwork.org for helpful resources, upcoming webinars, and other workshops and events. This webinar will be uh, archived along with all of our other webinars and can be viewed on Vermont Family Network's YouTube channel. If you would like to talk with someone at Vermont Family Network, please call 1-800-800-4005. I hope you all have a good day.